Between featuring Denise Reno came out last week and I thought I would give you a little breakdown about how I put this track together, kind of uh, in the spirit of doing these breakdown things. So I got a lot of questions uh, the last time I did one of these for Tempe and the one thing I forgot to do was show you which was on what was on my master bus and I promise you it's really, it's very unexciting. The only thing I have that's active is the Slate, uh, it's basically it's basically a SSL kind of compressor, like an SSL bus compressor, but it is supposed to be modeled after an SSL compressor with a Neve transformer, something like that. Um, this is my favorite bus compressor. I use this on basically every track, and it's always on my master. Um, I don't do any actual mastering in my mix sessions. That's usually a different process for me. But um, this really is barely doing anything at all. All it's doing is catching a very a little peak every now and then. And my settings are the thresholds at zero, practically. Um, I like a 10 millisecond attack, and I like a 300 millisecond release. That's just my own, I have, it's called ML and it's just my personal preset I made for the thing, and this is what I use on basically every mix. But if I play the track, uh, you're gonna hear that it's really, a lot of times it's not even pushing it at all. It's just slightly tickling the meter, just a little bit. And in moments where uh, there's a build or something, it just catches the tiniest little peaks. It's barely doing 1 dB of reduction, but I like the a little bit of color that it adds, and it's kind of a safety net for me, and I also used it just to gain down the master by 2 dB, just so I wasn't actually uh, clipping my bus. So that's the only thing on the master. Um, other than that, I sometimes, I will have a couple limiters at the end, just if I want to uh, kind of preview what a, a fake master is gonna sound like. And for that, I always use the, uh, the DMG Audio Limitless and also the Newfangled Audio Elevate. And I usually use them in conjunction, to be honest. Uh, I like I don't like pushing a limiter too hard, so I'd rather do a little bit with one and then a little bit more with another. So between the two, the DMG is doing about, it's pushing 3 dB, and this is all the even tide, or the newfangled even tide. They're twins. Um, that's also just adding another 3 dB, and together it's louder. <laughs> So that kind of just emulates uh, what a master might sound like, but I always do a little bit more than that. There's always a bit of EQ work, there's some multi band compression, um, usually some stereo width kind of things. So I usually don't do a lot of widening, but I do often uh, sum the sub to mono. So that's a, that's a different thing, and maybe I'll do a video about uh, how I master my own tracks at some point. So um, yes, if that's something you'd be interested in, I'm sure you would be, uh, say yes, and I will do it. So, in this track, it was, very, it was a very simple track, and it was written mostly on, um, I bought a Moog Sub 37 about a year ago, and all of this, before Denise came to the picture, um, this was mostly, entirely melodically written on the Moog, and using the, uh, the arpeggiator function to kind of create the arpeggio that's in this. And uh, it was just a very inspirational synth, and I really, I really fell in love with it, and I think I made four tracks within... God, a month? I mean, that's that's kind of unheard of for me. So that's why it's also a very synth-heavy track and much synth-heavier than really any of my tracks traditionally. So blame Moog or thank Moog, however you want to frame that. But um, this track instrumentally is entirely indebted to the Mub, or what is it? Uh, not Mub, it's a Moog, Moog sub. Moog subsequent 37. So let's take a look at Denise's vocals though. And she was in Bali at the time when I was working on the instrumental of this and I just sent it over to her and I wanna see if she was interested in working on it and fortunately for me, she was. So she wrote, I wanna say about half of the lyrics when she was in Bali and then she wrote the other half of it when she came to stay with me here in October and I could be totally wrong about that but I believe if memory serves me correctly, that's how it was done. And um, I'm just going to go through them and we'll talk about how they're processed and what's going on there. So the first thing you can see, these are her verses and they're doubled. 
So here is with or here's with that. Here's the original. Or the main lead, I should say. Felt just like real life. And all I believed was in my head. And here's with the double, which it's using the same exact processing as the lead, but I pulled it down about 9 dB and it just thickens it out a little bit. And all I believed was in my head. So I'll take it off this time. Terrestrial life created from stardust. And I'll put it back in. Tossing in my celestial bed. And I I really like doubling in general. Um, I do a lot of vocal work, especially if it's my own voice and I personally find my own voice, I need to double. Um, and it's there's no doubling plugin we're using. We just we tracked it multiple times and I comp together the best takes and add these takes that I created, um, the lead and then the double. But if we look at what's going on in the plugin chain, let's just take this line. Um, I'm gonna mute these for now. Here's without any, any processing at all. And, all I was in my head. and then I have an EQ and, all I was and it's functioning as nothing but a high pass filter and I'll explain why later. But um, all it's doing is just taking out any low end rumble. And then my vocal compressor on her, it's the UA LA2A. And this is one of my favorite vocal compressors. I've used this on vocals for years and years and years and it just sounds very musical and it's warm and I really just truly love it. And, all I believe was in my head. and it's not taking a whole lot of gain off her either. It's just tickling to 3 dB but um, it smooths it out a little bit, adds some color and that's all I want it to do. And then lastly this is where a lot of the heavy lifting comes in it's the FabFilter Pro MB, and I really like multiband compression on vocals. That's actually my, my EQ, if you will. It's my favorite way to process vocals because vocals by nature are so inherently dynamic. And I find if you try to do everything with EQ cuts, you often end up with a very um, possibly anemic sounding vocal because you're cutting out parts that don't need to be cut out of certain words and vocals are just hard. So I find a really a dynamic processor, like a multiband compressor, is really effective for me for the way I treat vocals. And the way I've basically carved it out is I've created different bands for different ranges of her voice, and uh, they're all acting independently depending on you know the, the inflections of her tone, her timbre, and altogether it really smooths out a vocal performance. And all I believed was in my head. And you can see the one that's working the hardest is this low mid thing, and it's sitting between it's 151 hertz to 600. And personally, um, and this really this is a taste thing, but I just don't like low mids and vocals because I think a lot of it too is a lot of what I tend to do instrumentally behind is usually pretty low mid heavy, which really makes a nightmare for me later. But Consequently, I'm always ducking out low mids, and especially when you're layering things together as well, then if there's low mids in both of your, you know, your lead and your double, or if you have multiple doubles, then you're going to get all this buildup in that low mid frequency range. So that's why I always use a multiband compressor to kind of tame everything. And then the other thing I'm doing with it, I'm actually using it as a de -esser. And I don't know if uh, this phrase will be particularly good about it, but here's without the high band. And all I believed was in my head. Probably on the... But with it, it just starts at about 5K. And then any time she gets a little too sissy... Um, is that a word? Sissy? Eh, it's a different word. It means something else. Um, it just pushes her down. And this is just my way of not having to need another plugin, like a de-esser plugin. This is functioning as exactly the same thing. And all I believed was in my head. Just a very effective way to get a lot of mileage out of one plugin. And then both of these vocals, they go to a verse bus. And this verse bus has a little bit more processing as well. It has, again, basically a redundant high pass filter on the DMG Audio Equilibrium. 
And then it's getting some compression from the Empirical Labs Arouser, which is one of my favorite compressors in general. I've always loved Empirical Labs distressors a lot. And this is more or less a distressor in plug-in form. So I find it really effective. And I use it, honestly, on a lot of different things. In this case, I'm using it on a vocal bus. And, all I believed was in my head. and again, it's just taking off just a few dB. Um, Again, I don't really like crunching things too hard. I'd rather use a lot of individual tools to kind of work together and uh, just not make anything work too hard individually. There is a vocal reverb on her, and that it's just a, uh, a UAD lexicon. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. Voxverb, that would be it. And all I believed was in my head. It's just a short three second reverb. Uh, it's not too loud in the mix in the verse, but I, I've always liked this reverb a lot. And this has been the vocal reverb I've used on countless vocalists over the years. It just sounds good to me. It sounds pretty true to an actual Lexicon, um, UAD or UA in general, they're, they're fantastic. So this is my go-to vocal reverb uh, a lot of the times. And in this case, here it is. And then the other, uh, the other big vocal part for her is the chorus section. And this is where the vocals get a lot bigger. There's a lot of automation, and I'll explain what that is in a second. Soloed all together, sounds like this. I see in your eyes A million different lives hidden in the space between so the first thing you might notice are, what are all these little automation dips right here? And that's more DSing. On top of having the same plug-in chain, more or less, that I had on the above vocals, where it's the same Equilibrium, LA-2A, Pro-MB. They're, again, it's that thing when you have a lot of frequencies building up with multiple layers, because now there are two doubles, and there's one hard center, and then there's one left and hard right. So anything that is pokey, and if it's the same in each vocal take, that's going to get amplified and then compressed together. And that's just, we don't want that. It's going to be too much. So what this is doing, this is actually more de-essing. And anytime there's an S, I just ducked it down just a few dB. Uh, in this case, it was four. In this case over here, it's two. It depends entirely on the word. I mean, there is, it's whatever sounds good. And you have to be careful not to overdo it because it's very easy to. And then you listen later in the car and your person sounds like they can't enunciate at all. So be gentle, but it is very effective because without it, it sounds like this. Life's hidden in the space between. And like this. In the space. In the space that, it, it drives me nuts. So that's why I have these little ducks. Life's hidden in the space between. Just smooths it out a little bit. And then I've basically gone and I've done that across everything. Um, because these vocals, I time corrected all of them. I used vocal line once I actually got the main one in time just because it's really fast and it's really efficient. Um, so I just grouped the vocals together and then the minute I do one thing on one, it, I guess it's not anymore, but, um, if I do automation on anything, it'll do it across all three. And it's just a very quick and easy way just to kind of speed up my workflow. And also, when you're doing a lot of little automation ducks and you have to do it across three or four separate tracks, yeah, that's gonna help you a lot. And then underneath that, this is actually one of my favorite parts because it's kind of hidden. It's a harmonizer. So I just took one of her leads and I sent it to the Antares harmonizer which it's kind of like the uh, image and heap hide and seek trick where it's not a vocoder. It is, um, it's a harmonizer where it's actually doing pitch shifting. And this is actually the MIDI right here where I just built chords, the song's in C minor, so I just built chords around what I wanted it to be. It's actually C Dorian if you want to be nerdy about it. But this MIDI ended up getting sent to um, the harmonizer and I printed the harmonizer and we got that. And together, layered with her vocals, it really, really makes it quite pretty. Fighting to be seen inside. Fighting to 
Just a nice little trick I found um, when I've worked on pop records and things like that. Um, if you don't have the ability to do a lot of harmonize or a lot of harmonies yourself, or you want the effect of that, it's a really quick and easy way to really get something cool. And then there are little bits up of here, like um, I kind of just took a little vocal loop of hers. There's even a little pop in there, but once you cover it with all the delays and reverbs, you don't hear it anymore. So I band passed it pretty hard using Equilibrium. And then there's an Echo Boy, and it's just a ping pong. Actually, let's go to a part that isn't too uh, filtered down. Then there's a reverb, and it's 100% wet, so it totally washes it out. Another EQ, just to further clean up the low end that the reverb was kind of creating. And then there's an LFO tool, and that's just doing a little bit of pumping. And that gets layered with everything else. And that is, for the most part, that is the vocals. Then if we start going down to the drums, um, this is a pretty simple track for me in general track-wise. It's really not that complex compared to some of the other things I've done. So the kick drum, it's called Titan Subby. Sounds like that. And it originally was a little bit different, just slightly. Um, this is the original version of it, which almost sounds identical, but uh, I wanted to fatten it just a little bit, so I pulled up the, uh, the newfangled Elevate, and I just added 2 dB. But it really just fattens out the whole kick just a little bit, and it rounds it out, and even if you take the waveform, and you say you took this and you compared it to the other, uh, let's make them the same size. You can see that the processed one, it's much more, it's squared off. I mean, it's really just all sub, whereas you can see a little bit more pitch decay, or amplitude decay, I'm sorry, on the uh, on the original. But, um, and in general, Elevate is a really handy plug, and I use it a lot just to make kicks a lot bigger. and. It's very CPU intensive, so I just print it, and then I make it inactive, and I move on, and I don't think about it ever again. So that's our kick. And then I have another kick layered underneath it, and you're going to see a few times. I kind of stole some of my own samples from other tracks. This is called uh, Patchwork Hertz Donut Kick. So layered with the kick. But there's some EQ work, and it's just taking out the ultra low end. And that's it for kicks. There's a shaker. And it's literally just uh, one of these. Then there's a stapler. And fun story. It's that. This little little red stapler that uh, Milton from Office Space would go nuts to get his hands on, but he can't because now I have it and he can't have it. But that actually, that functions as a hi-hat. I mean, it is it is kind of a cool little sound. And then there is another hi-hat and I stole this from Tempe, or from Tempe to Starming actually, but I edited it a little bit, I made it short. But layered with the other tops, I guess you could call them. And then if we go further down, I mean, that's mostly it for quite a while. As the track evolves, you get a 909 hat.
And it's just getting some EQ work to really just, you know, bring out the high end. And then there's a break, or a rim shot from a break. And it came from a Blue Martin sample. Um, well, not, I shouldn't say sample, but like a, a pack he made. And and there's a fair amount of EQ work on that as well. And then there's a snap. And then there's a snare, and this snare came directly out of a machine drum, uh, which is uh, this guy right there. And that's a cat. And it's really resonant, and um, I kind of made it like that, and then I wanted to bring out the resonance even higher. So I basically found the resonant frequency, which was this guy. And I just brought it up a little bit because then when that layers with the other claps or snaps or whatever you want to call them, it makes it really nice and pokey. And then there are these other little fills and also machine drum, uh, pretty EQ'd without the EQ. Then I'm taking out a lot of the high end, a lot of the low end, I'm adding some of that you know, high mid crackiness. And then there's also this underneath it as well, doing the same exact rhythm. And that came directly out of the Moog itself, and it was just uh, kind of playing it while opening up the filter without the EQ. There's a lot of low end. So I wanted to take all that out. And the only other percussion that eventually gets added in just a couple hi-hats, I call them live hi-hats. One sounds like this, it's panned to the left. One sounds like that, it's panned to the right. Um, the EQs are actually not the same at all, um, which makes sense because they're different hi-hats. So the guy on the right, taking out a lot of the mid-range, adding a little bit of high-end. And then that's going through a Valhalla, a vintage verb. Um, plate setting, short, really short reverb. That's totally wet. And then the other side is just taking out the low end. And then basically the same exact reverb setting. So if we layer all the drums together, sounds like this. And that's it. Um, they're not even getting bust to a drum bus. Uh, I just didn't do it because I just didn't. Um, there isn't a lot going on, so they're all just going to like straight to the master. There are a couple effects, mostly reverse crashes. Nothing you haven't heard before. Well, they're a bit granular, so there is that. But um, that's just time stretching. And then because I was, you know, playing with the Moog, I, I just wanted to record some really basic filter sweeps with just white noise. And then this gets layered in underneath the granular symbols. And that's really it for sound effect effects. And then there's another crash, which is just more just Moog white noise. And uh, it's got a nice big reverb on it. Same Valhalla thing with a nice long reverb. Then, I mean, so much of the low end's being taken out. Here's without the EQ. Oh, I'm sorry, this one. There wasn't a ton in there in the first place, I guess, but that's what it's doing. And then if we get down to the bass, cause there is, there's a lot of bass in this track. Um, the first thing you're going to see are the little bass hits. And I totally stole these from um, two tracks of mine. One's from Removes Me and one's from You'll Remember Me. And here's Removes Me. 
And here's Remember Me. Kind of the same sounding, but you know, just slightly different. So when you play them together, junk junk. And then there's also this Reese kind of layered in underneath that. And because I was trying to do a lot with the Moog at the time, that came from the Moog, but I, uh, I basically took a, a raw sample and uh, I threw it into contact and it's called Moog Reese A. So without any of the processing, it just sounds like this. Um, But then uh, one of the ways I like to do Reese's a lot is I like the unison mode in contact. And then uh, I like legatos and I do like a fair amount of glide so you can kind of do like the drum bassy. Kind of thing. Um, so then I add some distortion and isotope trash. definitely makes it a lot louder and gives it a little bit of grit. The thing that is uh, important about this is that there's actually a high pass filter in Trash before the distortion because without it, it sounds really very different. With the filter before it. It, uh, it smooths it out. And remember, I mean, I don't want a ton of low end in this thing because there's still a lot more bass. I just want this to kind of be a band passy kind of thing. And then there's another EQ underneath it just to get rid of anything underneath 110. And that's really all this little stab is. It's just that patch. And then there are some other stabs, and these came directly out of the Moog as well. And it's just tuning fifths, taking a root, taking a second oscillator, putting up seven steps up. Um, sawtooth waves, because why not? Then, same thing like always, there's a high pass filter taking a lot out. Then there is a filter that gets used uh, really purely for automation. And then uh, another reverb. And it's just another one of like the Valhalla vintage verbs in a more vintagey setting. And that's all it's doing. Now this is where all the sub really comes from. And you have this very low bass. And that is straight out of the Moog and it's just compression and EQ basically going on. So without any of that. Then I'm just taking out a little bit more of the low end because it was really rumbly. Then I'm using that arouser, the Empirical Labs plugin again. And not taking too much off, but just smoothing it a little bit. And then I'm using LFO tool just to do some very clean pumping against the kick. And then there's a version of that as well that it's a fifth. And it's got a reverb on it as well. Um, I got away with it because there's no sub in it anymore. But layered with the sub, you get this. So it's almost like a like an organ kind of thing. And then with all the bass layered together, it sounds like this. And a lot of the hits, they kind of just dance around each other. But that's how um, that's how the bass is made on this. Then there are there are all the little arpeggios. Almost kind of makes me think of a, a Knight Rider kind of thing. Just straight out of the Moog. 
totally dry, it sounds like this. And then it's got a ping pong. And then even tied black hole. And then an EQ, high pass filter. And then there are two variations of this, uh, this arpeggio. So there's that one. And then this is actually the playful one. And what's really fun about this one is it's, um, it's not in 4-4, it's in 5-8. So if you look at the grid itself, um, this is the pattern. And I guess it's 5-4. So when you take that and you put it over, uh, let's take our kick drum. Uh, actually, you know what, let's take a bit where towards the end we can do it. So now we can take that and layer it on top of something that's really obviously 4-4, four four, like a 4x4 four four kick and snare. Um, let's take that. And for the purpose of this, I'm just gonna take our snare and move it over as well. So if you pay attention, the start of that arpeggio is completely offset. It's from the rest of the beat. And that's what's so fun about it. And I think that's what actually kind of makes it hypnotic is because there's that tension of it rhythmically being foreign. And um, this is kind of, it comes from my love of like progressive rock bands like King Crimson and then later Dream Theater and Tool. I've always loved polyrhythms. Um, so this is something I try to kind of incorporate in a fun, in a fun way. And in dance music, it's really effective. Um, I mean, Dead Mouse has done this quite a bit as well because it is very, entrancing if you think about or yeah if it is entrancing because um you kind of get lost in the space and like you know where where is the beat falling and i i really find that uh very very effective and i found just to kind of really make it obvious that this was you know in an odd type signature there's a little break and that's where the arpeggio completely just stays in five four and there's nothing else going on the track. And then it cuts back into um, the verse. And then the final part of this track that, um, the reason I did this is because the rest of the track was so highly synthetic already. So I wanted to, aside from Denise of course, and so I wanted to add a little bit more um, like acoustic instrumentation into it. And uh, that was just because I felt it was, it was too electronic already. So I bought a cello last year and I, uh, I'm a very, very poor cellist, but I just recorded a few different takes and this gets layered in underneath kind of transition into the verse or uh, into that five, four section. And it sounds, they're basically, there are three parts to it. You have, I'm going to take off the automation just to uh, make it easier to hear for the time being. So you have this. And this tracks twice, panned left and right, just like I would if I were doing guitars. Same exact thing. There's a fifth right above it. And then on top of that, there's this pad. And it's just kind of 
playing a fifth very, very lightly and dragging the bow and kind of try to get some harmonics out of it. And I am not a trained cellist. I really am terrible at this. But um, for making kind of atmospheric things, I think my own inadequacy at playing the instrument works in my favor. Although if I were actually good at it, I'm sure I could just do this on command, but I'm not. So this is what I get. And that gets layered then with the other parts. And that was just a way for me to bring another live element into this track. Um, processing wise, it's uh, on each of the individual main channels, pretty much I'm just using this Brainworks SSL. And it's just really doing compression more than anything else. There is a touch of EQ. Um, I mean, not touch, it's 8 dB of gain, but it's a 8K. It's just bringing out kind of like the hair of the bow, if you will. And same exact thing on the fifth. They all go to a bus together though, and multiband compression, again, just kind of like cleaning out that low end, mid range is necessary, and EQ also, without it, with it. And then it's going also into the same B2 reverb. The pad, that goes to its own bus. And same SSL thing, the Brainworks SSL. Similar, fair amount of EQ work, but I took out all the low end because I needed to sit on top of, you know, the low end of this. So there's no reason for them to fight against each other. And then more multiband compression. Although, I don't even know if it's really doing anything, to be honest. Pretty certain I just kind of pulled that from the other track, just in case. Um, same EQ. And then I have another EQ here, and um, it's actually just functioning. It's functioning as gain automation. And the reason why there is that is because there already is volume automation. So I just wanted to bump up that one little bit. So I just threw another plugin on there, and I just chose Equilibrium because in my plugin chain, I have it set as a shortcut, so it's right there. So it's quicker to do that than to pull up a game plugin. So that's why I did that. And that's basically all of the track. The only other thing that gets added is that the basically towards the end there's some Rhodes piano. And it's kind of nice if you layer it in with the cellos. And all it's doing, it's just, um, it's reinforcing the chord motion. And then if we add that with the low bass, is entirely the space between. It is, it's a very radio friendly track and it's a simple track for that reason. So hopefully this gave you some insight into how it's put together. And um, really a huge thank you to Denise who this track would not be in its final form as it is now had it not been for her and you know her talent. She's an absolutely incredible singer and writer. So this track and myself are very, very indebted to her. And that is it. So I hope you enjoy this. If you haven't heard the record yet, 
It is out right now. It's on Mousetrap. It came out uh, last week. So go check it out and I will leave a link to it at the end of this video or I guess underneath the description, whatever. And uh, enjoy. See ya.